funny. Guess you had to be there. Welcome to Hemp Logic Radio, where we attempt to sift facts from opinions in this upside down world of industrial hemp. Oh boy, guys, we have a wonderful show this morning. I got to tell you, uh, we're just on the phone here ten minutes before uh, talking talking uh, this out, and it's going to be a good show. I can tell you that right now. Uh, from the last podcast, I don't know if you remember or not, I was looking for a co-host. Well, my wife slapped me alongside the head and said, hey, how come I can't be your co-host? Welcome Beth Sharp. She is now the co-host and executive producer of the Hemp Logic Radio. Hey, Beth. Good morning, everybody. Yes. Oh, yeah, thanks. Pretty thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. That's awesome. I feel very loved and welcome. Yeah. Hey, so uh, where are you, by the way? I, I know you're, you're calling in, but where's, what's your location? I'm sitting here in my pickup, just <laughs> chatting away. <laughs> I'm I'm in an undisclosed location because uh, my my husband and I are um, busy doing other stuff at this very second. I'm taking care yeah, of the sure. people and. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. So, hey guys, so we're gonna, today we're going to be talking about insurance. Uh, we've got. Uh, Moving on, we've got uh, Daniel Mays, my, sorry, Jesus Christ, uh, and Kenny Hallisey from IMA Insurance. Uh, welcome, guys. Welcome. Good morning, Corey. Well, thanks, Corey and Beth. Good to hear your guys' voice again. Yeah, we, we have quite well, a history. With, we have quite a history with these two. We were in uh, um, New Orleans back in July, or was it August? I think it was July. It was um, July. Was it July? Yeah, good good no. times there. <clears throat> These guys definitely know how to have dinner. That's definitely that's that's a true <laughs> statement. Gee, many Christmas. Um, so uh, Kenny, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background on IMA Insurance? Um, I've got here, you know, it's uh, you're it's, we were talking earlier about having being fairly a large uh, insurance company. Um, you guys do just you do more than insurance. Um, you know, you got a lot of things. You want to talk about what IMA does? Sure. Yeah, no no problem, Corey. Um, obviously, you guys are going to have record attendance uh, if you listed that it was going to be an insurance discussion. That's actually what people are most interested <laughs> in, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, but what, real briefly, we've kind of got a, a triangle of different insurance companies that are on the call here. That, and uh, the three agencies, uh, we work very closely and have decided to partner together. And so uh, in, in here in a few minutes, uh, we'll let Jared and, and Ted talk a little bit about crop insurance, which is really what, uh, what people are most interested in and what your, inter- your listeners are probably most interested in from an insurance standpoint. But, but real quickly, um, IMA is one of the largest private insurance brokers in the country. Uh, we have a very large um, office in Wichita, Kansas, where our ag department and hemp niche appropriately sits. Uh, we got involved, I often tell this story, and, and I think it's probably how we talked originally, Corey, but about 20 year, years ago, uh, insurance carriers didn't know anything about the ethanol industry. And if you think about what insurance is, it's, it's ultimately to help businesses with the unknown and unforeseen problems. And so, therefore, there's the less an insurance underwriter knows, generally speaking, the higher the insurance spend will will be. And there wasn't much of an underwriting history on ethanol. And so we worked closely with a company called ERI Solutions uh, and made it a point to understand as much about the industry as possible. And, and that investment of time and resources has allowed both ERI and IMA to now work with nearly half the total U.S. ethanol production. And so our ag team saw the same opportunity in hemp, and we've been traveling the country visiting with companies from seed to sale for a couple of years now. And, I mean, we were, we were in Oregon, you know, last August as we were just talking, picking males out of the field with, uh, with you and Beth. So I, I'm not sure how many insurance brokers can say they've done that. 
Uh, but yeah. we, we really wanted to understand the process. So um, it, a little bit about, so Dan will kind of be on here to answer any real specific property casualty insurance uh, comments you guys might have. But through this last couple of years and process, we have really been on the lookout for the right crop insurance partners. Um, IMA does a lot of the expert crop to, I don't know how many crop insurance folks across the country, um, and we're never really satisfied with their knowledge of maybe the crop insurance industry, more so the industry. And so uh, whenever we um, more about them on something, it's not a good sign. So eventually uh, that led us to uh, Jared and, and Ted Long. Uh, Jared with the National Hemp Insurance Agency and Ted with Diversified Crop Insurance Services, who's a carrier, and um, once we talked to them, uh, we knew they were our guys. And so we, we, we decided to partner with these guys uh, in hemp opportunities going forward throughout the country. And uh, I think it would be appropriate to, to maybe have those guys give an introduction, uh, Corey, to, to yeah. uh, both the <clears throat> private and federal uh, crop insurance markets. Yeah, so, you know, let's go ahead and introduce. I got, I got Ted Lung. Um, so far, what I know about Ted is uh, he's a business development manager for Diversified Crop Insurance, and uh, he's been in the hemp or the insurance business a total of over 30 years. Uh, yeah, that's a wow. long time to be in the insurance business. Ted, welcome to the show. Good morning, Corey. Good morning, Beth. Thank you for having me uh, on the show this morning. Good morning. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I've, I actually uh, sold my very first crop insurance policy before I ever got my high school diploma. I sold my first policy in 1982 as a senior in high school. So that's how wow. far I go back in the crop insurance industry. Wow. Wow. They're, they're yeah. in the Midwest? Yeah, I'm in uh, West Central Illinois, good old Adams okay. County. Nice. Right. Yeah. But uh, the company that I that I uh, work for is Diversified Crop Insurance Services, and just so you know, there's about 14 crop insurance companies nationwide, and Diversified Crop Insurance Services is one of those 14 national crop insurance companies. And uh, one thing I love about this company, this company actually started out, uh, the grassroots of this company actually started out as an insurance agency first, serving the farmer, boots on the ground. And uh, uh, they grew tremendously and uh, kind of metamorphosed from an insurance agency to the next highest level as an insurance company. And, uh, and they became an insurance company um, in the uh, early 2000s, and now we write over a billion dollars of crop insurance premium nationwide. Wow, that's that's incredible. Um, hey, Ted, yeah. you got you have you have uh, Jared Lung. Uh, he is I'm a, I'm going to just assume because of the last name somehow related. Yeah, there's a little bit of relation there. Yep, my uh, son Jared. Yep. Oh, yeah, Jared, Jared cool. Lung, uh, he obviously related to Ted, um, but he's also a uh, a, a uh, he op owns and operates National Hemp Insurance Agency, which that's is why we're having this show is to talk about hemp insurance. Jared, you want to chime in? Hey, good morning, uh, Corey and Beth. Uh, great to be here, and uh, uh, really enjoy meeting you guys. And I'm um, excited to talk about uh, crop insurance for hemp this morning. Well, I, I got to say, what Kenny, when he first called me up and he says, "Hey, I think I want to do that. I want to do that insurance podcast now." I found I found a group that these guys know everything to know about hemp crop insurance. I've never met somebody that doesn't know it doesn't have the knowledge base that these guys have. So just to give you a little, uh, give Kenny a little bump there, he was uh, definitely talking you guys up. <laughs> Uh, yeah. we're, we're learning. We're learning new stuff every day. Believe me. Oh, yeah. I think if they, yeah, but in Corey, the hemp I business, also told them how great you were. Oh, <laughs> you, 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 totally, you know, uh, 
Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, <laughs> you know you go for lying, right? <clears throat> so, um, I don't know, Ted, if you or Ted or Jared, if you, whichever one wants to talk about, uh, you know, let's talk about hemp crop insurance and what it is and what what we can do with it and what you can't do with it. But I don't know which one you guys want to take the lead on this, but. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, sure. I'll it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. This is Ted. I'll jump in there, Corey. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and tell us actually, what, what it is. As everybody what do with it. Yeah, as everybody knows, hemp is in the 2018 farm bill, and uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's one of those it's a push that actually came from Washington. It's a, and um, so a little background. I've known for the last couple of years that uh, hemp was going to be a part of the federal crop insurance program. I go to D.C. quite often. I spent a large majority of my time out in D.C. last year um, uh, on the Hill, and I had over 225 meetings with uh, representatives on the House and the Senate side, and I met with all the House and Senate Ag Committee members. So I've known for a couple of years now hemp uh, was uh, kind of shoved in the pipe, and there was a lot of momentum uh, uh, out there for ensuring industrial hemp. So I've known for quite some time, and I'm and I'm very pleased that the USDA and the RMA and the uh, House and Senate Ag Committees. I'm very pleased that they stepped up to the plate, and and now we're we're uh, really pushing and driving for uh, ensuring industrial hemp. And um, so. Uh, the uh, the USDA and the RMA, they contracted a, a company to do all the research and development and to come up with a with a hemp uh, insurance policy, and uh, that was Agrologic Consulting. And so uh, the USDA came out this year with their very first uh, uh, federal crop uh, product. It's called the APH plan. And uh, we're past the sales closing now on the APH plan, but that is a yield-based program. It's a uh, it's a multi-peril program. So when you think about a peril, you think about what are all the natural causes of loss out there that could damage the hemp plant. You know, it could uh, it, all the weather-related uh, um, issues a, a person can have, from temperature to precipitation. You know, it's too cold, too hot. It's uh, it rains too much. It it doesn't rain enough. Uh, from hail to wind, so all that is covered on the new APH plan now. But um, you know, this is the very first year that the uh, 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 RMA has actually offered coverage like this. And hats off to the RMA, uh, the Risk Management Agency, for offering this plan. I applaud them for their efforts. Um, it, it's it is a pilot program, so it's only available in 21 states. But I, I see that um, expanding rapidly going into the 21 season. I would say this year they did a fantastic job. They kind of uh, dipped their toe in the water uh, with it. It's a pilot program. It's available in limited counties and limited states. But it's a really, really, really good policy for, for them coming out year number one offering something like this. Um, also, hey Ted. Yeah, go ahead. Hey Ted, yes. it's Dan. Can you can you kind of talk about some of the qualifications for that? I, I think a misconception is that first year producers think they can, if they're in that eligible county, they can hop right in that. So can you kind of lay out the qualifications for that program? Yeah. Or so what they were. So yeah, unfortunately, a lot of uh, individuals that wanted that coverage this year were not able to qualify because. In order to qualify, there's well, there's what we call applicant qualifications and there's crop quali- crop qualifications. So, for the grower, you have to have at least one year of prior insurance experience. I'm, I'm sorry, prior growing experience. And um, uh, and that threw most people out. A lot of the people that wanted uh, the coverage, this was their first year growing it, and so it, it threw them out of eligibility. But um, also, too, for the people that even did qualify as far as applicant qualifications, there were some crop qualifications that actually um, um, threw it out also where they weren't able to qualify. Like, for example, there is a, uh, a rotation requirement. 
So a, a lot of guys this year, a lot of growers this year, were raising hemp on the very same ground at, uh, that they raised hemp on last year. Well, under the crop rotation requirements, uh, that's not insurable. So if you raise hemp on the same ground this year as the ground you had last year in hemp, that's not insurable on this new EPH plan. And then also, too, there's what we call, there's minimum acreage requirements. for So for CBD, there's a minimum of five acres required to qualify. And then for grain and fiber, there's a minimum of 20 acres to qualify. So that's what made it kind of difficult this year for a lot of people to, to get on the APH plan. But I... I, I feel like now that a lot of people are learning the rules and uh, the requirements that um, in 2021, as the plan gets better, as people become more educated, um, I think it's just going to continue to get better year by year. So what, <clears throat> one of the things I know being uh, – being, growing last year and whatnot, let's, let's take this maybe, maybe – uh, we get Jared in here and, and Jared, let's say that you, someone gets, <clears throat> I've got a hundred acres that I want to grow hemp on. Can you walk us through kind of the process? Because I know it can be complex and, and let's walk through it's And you ask us some of the questions you're going to ask a farmer and, and let's see if we can walk through a, just an initial phone call of somebody that calls in. So yeah, sure. is, that, is that okay? Um, so, yeah, definitely. One thing I like to do uh, when talking to uh, you know kind of a new prospect um, is develop a grower profile. Um, and on that grower profile, um, basically, I ask a series of questions. Um, obviously, I want to know uh, where they're growing at, um, you know, state and county, um, and also you know if if they have a a license to grow. On that license, it'll also give kind of a township and range, which is a more narrow window of exactly where they're growing. Um, and once you've established kind of the location, that helps determine if they're in one of those states um, that is in the federal plan. Um, and if they're not in one of those states or counties, then I take uh, the next approach, which is um, kind of identifying the different private um, insurance products that I have to offer. I offer four different products. Um, one of three of them are, um, nationwide products. One of them is in 20 States. Um, so then I kind of, you know, take the next step, what exactly that they could potentially qualify for. So if, you know, um, if they do have that year experience, if they are doing a minimum of five acres uh, for CBD, um, then I go and identify the hemp type. So, if you are growing it um, for 100 acres of CBD, according to the APH plan, they need to know: Are you, um, if you're doing it for biomass, you know, are you trimming the flowers off, or are you chopping up the whole plant? Um, are you doing it uh, seeded, direct seeded, or, or are you transplanting? Um, are you irrigated or non-irrigated? So there's um, there's several questions like that that I. I used um, to establish kind of a profile. Um, also, their plant date, um, you know, if they have a processor contract in place. Um, also, what's what's uh, their input cost per acre? Um, you know, with, with uh, insurance, you know, you definitely want to uh, cover your input costs so you're not out anything. Um, but you can also determine, um, you know, if you want to be able to lock in um, lock in some profits, and so they, the grower needs to kind of uh, determine how much coverage that they want. Um, one other thing is you wanted to you want to think about what different perils concern you. Some of the uh, most common ones um, that I have seen is um, too wet during planting um, or too wet during harvest, um, and then also high high heat and uh, drought. Um, when the flowering stage occurs, and then there's also wind and hail. So I think those are some of some of the biggest ones that definitely um, affect hemp. So once that uh, grower profile is established, you know, um, filling out this kind of questionnaire, 
then it goes to what products they're able to qualify for, what ones that I can recommend. Um, and, um, you know, there's, uh, two federal plans and four private plans that I can offer. So that, that's kind of how I get started with that scenario. Yeah. I, I know last year, I, quite a few people hit, hit, hit me up, uh, looking to, you know, insure, insure our crop, but, you know, we were looking at, I think they wanted, oh, I want to, it was a lot of money and it was private. And so all it was, mm-hmm. was a bunch of guys with money running around the country saying, well, so, you know, <laughs> we'll ensure your crop uh, from hail and, you know, acts of God, but there was nothing else. And it was very, very expensive. So mm-hmm. it's good to, good to know that, we, you know, the, the industry and, you know, Ted doing his work in DC <clears throat> that we add some legitimacy to this, uh, this endeavor because uh, you know, I think a lot of times that farmers and you might agree that, that hemp farmers are not normally uh they don't come from the big the bigger agriculture um you know industry so you know you're talking you you said something about you know uh your cost per acre how many times have we heard where you know farmers don't have any clue what cost Mm -hmm. per acre means um and so i'm sure you're educating just like most of us end up educating somebody on the phone uh about what they're actually trying to grow. And that just boggles my mind. <laughs> the amount of money that they're putting in the ground. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, I've heard so, upwards of, you know, these guys are $12,000 an acre just getting in the ground. Holy. Cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's pretty common on a, on a low end. You'll see maybe around uh, five to 6,000 acre. Uh, if they're doing a real large scale, they could probably get it down to maybe three to $4,000 an acre. Uh, but also to, you know, uh, determines your cost if you're irrigating or not. Uh, you know, if you're running uh-huh. uh, maybe a pivot or if you're running trenches or if you're doing drip tape, um, are you putting plastic mulch over that drip tape? Um, are you direct seeding, which is maybe around a dollar a seed versus if you're transplanting um, kind of like you would a vegetable, um, that's more around the three to $3 to $5 um, a plant. And you'll want to run about uh, determining on your variety about uh, 1,600 to 2,400 plants per acre. Um, so there's there's a lot of uh, factors when it comes into your cost per acre. Um, you know, so I can very greatly. Mo- I would say most common is around that eight to twelve thousand dollars an acre of input costs. <laughs> yeah, we're and we're seeing that really, and that's starting to come down. People are getting, you know, uh, you know back March of last year, I was at a, at a uh, cloning facility in New Mexico and these guys wanted to charge three and $4 a clone. And I said, guys, you know, you might be able to get that this year, but come 2020, if you're not at 75 cents or under a dollar, you're not going to make it. And they look, no, no, this is, you know, but that was back when gold was falling from the sky, you know, it was like manna. Woo, mm-hmm. we got gold. We're going to be rich. We're going to make bank. Yeah. Come 2020, everybody's licking their wounds and, you know, trying to figure out the best way to do it. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing the, the cost of uh, input costs starting to drop uh, substantially. Uh, you can buy, you can have seedlings delivered with support for a dollar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely see that shifting in the market, and I think for, for next year, it's going to have to be uh, more affordable um, as far as either going with uh, seeds or seedlings. I've seen uh, seed prices um, dropping from, you know, maybe around a dollar, dollar and a quarter down to even 60 and 70 cents a seed. Um, so I think, you know, once the once the market kind of levels out, I think next year um, – a lot of the sticker shock is going to go down. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, you know, you can buy a seed for 60 cents, but you still have to propagate it. You still have to get it mm-hmm. in a, you know, how exactly, if you're going to direct seed, you know, we, th- we've talked with some people about auto flower and that's that direct seed. So you're direct seeding, you know, an auto flower and that's really good for the Southern States, but uh, it's not going to work up in your, your, uh, your Northern your northern territories very well. Um, 
so you can buy these 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 feminized seeds, but you know we can get into another whole that's another whole topic of, of where the industry sure. is going as far as genetics. But um, you know, so you 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 definitely you're having these conversations with the farmers. How are you how are you cultivating? And then I'm sure you're even you're asking questions on how do you plan on harvesting this um Mm -hmm. harvesting drying you know what how far does this insurance cover you know i know kenny and and dan and i have had these conversations of what happens after the harvest you know as far as transportation and whatnot but is your crop insurance is it how far does it go does it go right to the edge of the field how far how far out does it cover yeah so um for hemp crop insurance, um, it's coverage for um, not under a greenhouse structure, so it's out in the field, and it's from when the the plant goes into the soil until the severance of the stalk. Okay. So once so once it's harvested, then that's when crop insurance coverage ends. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where Dan Dan and and our team kind of pick up is after harvest. That's why this. This uh, this kind of partnership really made sense. Kenny, you want to st- you want to yeah. chime in there and kind of talk a little bit about after the after the fact. I mean, you got to just you know, unless um, you know, Jared, you got anything? You know, uh, obviously we do. We, uh, before we do that, let's go. Let's talk about. Can you talk about cost per acre? I mean, it, without it's. I'm sure it's just like anything else. It's like depends. You know, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of factors. Um, I mean, it you, there's a yeah. I'll give you an example uh, for hail. Um, hail is uh, the rate on that is determined by several factors, um, and it's on a state and county and even a township basis. So that's one reason why I established that grow profile uh, to be able to make uh, to to quote for hail also. Um, and so for hail, uh, it can either be a state rate, it can be a uh, flat county rate, or it can be a county township and range rate. And those rates vary greatly. Um, and so, you know, they can be um, anywhere between, um, there's two different deductible levels. One is 10% and one is 50%. Um, and for instance, um, it'd be around, uh, five dollars per one hundred dollars of coverage. Um, that's one that I've I've seen quite a bit, but it can even be as high as um, some areas in Colorado where I've seen where they have extreme uh, hail damage, and it's very common. Um, upwards of thirty to thirty-three dollars per one hundred dollars of coverage. So it it um, cost per acre varies greatly. Um, there's other private products that are around uh, the 10 to 12 percent of liability range. So if you wanted ten thousand dollars of coverage, it'd cost you about twelve hundred dollars an acre. Um, so there's there's a lot of factors that determine uh, the rate per acre, uh, which product you want, where you're located. Definitely. No insurance on the genetics, of course. Or do you? No. No, they're they're not on specific <laughs> genetics. No, I mean so <laughs> so somebody buys some genetics from the guy on the corner with the little Ziploc baggie, and you're not going to cover that. You're not even going to you you do you is that a question that you ask the guy the farmer is where did you you know where are your genetics coming from? Is that I mean I I can see the insurance com- in, industry actually requiring <clears throat> to know where the genetics are coming from. Um, it's, it's not really that much about the genetics as much as how you, uh, maintain, uh, your field, the actual farmer practice. Um, I would think if, you know, if you're buying bad genetics, it would be, um, it would be more of getting the male plants out of the field. You know, if you're buying bad seed, um, also, um, it would affect your yield a little bit. Mm Um, so it, Yeah, that, that's one thing that's not really talked about much. You have a private uh, option that is or that that has a pretty big focus on genetics, don't you? There, there is a private product that we have called uh, it's called Hemp Guard, and um, they um, are uh, it's a good product for this year because it 
uh, for those who don't qualify for the APH federal plan, um, this private plan, um, it's in 20 states, and they offer the same type of coverage uh, against the perils that the APH plan, um, but there is a genetic requirement uh, for the for that product, and there's also uh, some other farmer practice requirements, some underwriting requirements uh, for that plan also. So in in that private product, uh, genetics definitely is a is an, of a great concern. Mm. Oh, this insurance this insurance uh, topic is. Uh... <laughs> it's definitely interesting. Very uh, complex. Kenny, it's yeah, very complex, very complex, and it, and it can get a little, uh, it can be a little bit uh, daunting to tell you the truth. So Kenny, uh, we get it, we get it on, we get it in the field, we get it grown, we get it harvested. Uh, take us from there. What what is what can you help us with? Yeah, absolutely. Dan, Dan the man, are you still on? Dan, Dan yeah, the I'm man, here. the vegan. I'm- Dan, Dan the vegan Dan, man. Dan is the guy that has <laughs> Dan built Dan the program. vegan man. <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's me. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, he, it's he been an interesting ride. These, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been an interesting ride these last three years um, in the property casualty insurance space with hemp. Um, we've been working hard to develop underwriters. There's a handful of carriers. Um, we call them specialty carriers that will write property and liability um, on hemp operations from soil to oil, if you will. But um, we've been successful in developing some standard markets and developing some programs um, specific to the hemp industry. And so, Corey, your question about, okay, we, we, we cut the stocks, we pick the flowers, whatever we're doing, um, where's insurance go there? Um, we do have the ability to insure – uh, the biomass, once it is um, packaged, so it, it's got to be super stacked, bailed. It just can't be thrown into the bed of a truck. But once it is organized and, and loaded um, onto a bed of a truck in a field, we can have coverage attached there. Um, basically, it would be a, um, I mean, the type of a program is a stock throughput program, but it would be coverage from that point um, through transportation, in storage at a warehouse, drying. Um, through the work in progress, if we are turning it into CBD, um, winterized crude, distillate, isolate, all the way through to the end user, we can have coverage with this program. So very robust um, program there. Really, we look at it in kind of two silos, if you will. Um, the, 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 the best program available is for the larger operations. Um, somebody's going to have to be doing and, and transporting 50 million plus worth of values annually for it to make sense from a minimum premium standpoint. Minimum premiums, we're looking about 75 grand for this type of program. Um, but whenever we have high valued flowers and oils, you know, it's well worth it. Um, for the for the smaller players, uh, the more boutique operations, we have um, programs we can put in place for them too. You know, the guys who are going to have limits, you know, and storage of, you, you name it, 25000 to $2.5 million. Um, so there are options out there available. And uh, I'm specifically talking about the pro- or the stock and the property because that's the toughest placement. Um, a- any prospect calls me up and, and wants to go get a liability policy, a, a general liability or product liability policy, we can, within five days, have three to four quotes on the table for them. And uh, when we first got into this three years ago, you know, that was probably the most surprising thing to me is I would have thought that product liability would have been the tougher placement because it's a human consumable and there's hardly any, um, well, there's, you know, that I know of very few court cases out there. A lot of people haven't been sued over taking CBD. Um, heaven forbid we kill somebody's dog with CBD. There just wasn't a lot of history, a lot of claims history around it. But um, securing a product liability quote is not tough and it's not um, crazy expensive. It's the property side where underwriters start getting nervous um, because, you know, some of the first deals that we put together, you have a 4,000 square foot warehouse and um, you've got $15 million worth of stock in there. And they're thinking, wow, <laughs> what's the difference? You know, and we're going to them saying this, there's no difference between insuring hemp or corn. It's all a commodity. It's the same thing. 
And they're like, well, the values are huge, you know, and the difference is we're insuring diamonds, not cubic zirconium is, is kind of how we've explained it and helped develop the market. But um, I guess moral of the story is there's options out there from the time that the crop is harvested all the way through to the end user from a stock standpoint. Um, other issues on the property would be obviously buildings, extraction equipment, um, business interruption coverage, very popular topic right now with COVID-19 going on. Um, so all, all of those coverages are available. We can definitely um, help out. There's multiple options out there. And then the casualty side with the product liability, the general liability, and the excess. Um, like I mentioned earlier, plenty of options there for them. Wow. You, you gotta, you, you, you're well versed in that, Dan. <clears throat> it's, well it's my first day. <laughs> you've, I think you've said that. I think you've uh, you've you've uh, you've spewed that out a few times. You're pretty, that's pretty uh, well versed there. Wow. <laughs> you know, I gotta I gotta say that the the uh, you know the insurance side of this whole thing, and and Kenny when he reached out to me, oh man, it's got to be eighteen months or so. Eighteen months or so, Kenny Indeed. reached out to me, and uh, you know, of course, I'm oh god, insurance, you know, but. That you guys are totally just salt of the earth guys, you know, and, and hanging out with you in, in New Orleans, you guys are just you good you're good you're good people, man. You would actually almost think you guys actually had dirt underneath your fingernails and you actually worked for a living. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> oh, here we go. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we don't have those dirty podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Corey, one other thing I'd like to throw out there is uh, yeah. the, the, the market is evolving. So while the majority of the carriers that will will um, offer these quotes now, like I said, are the specialty carriers, they're higher rates. Um, it, it, it's crazy, you know, because I've seen um, property quotes come across the line. And it, it, this is what we always tell people, whether we're your broker or somebody else is your broker, make sure they know what they're doing because I've seen multiple property quotes come across. I mean, you and I both know if you see a hemp property quote come through and we're talking about a closed loop ethanol extraction facility and they're excluding all flammable liquids, we have a problem, <laughs> right? It, you're buying a $20,000 policy for what? Um, also, if there's an exclusion in there that says we won't cover any hemp stock if it tests above 0 0.00 THC, also problem um we you know and, and so there's a lot of nuances out there that we're working through but the point is the market is evolving and there are carriers coming through and, and it's really cool to see especially on the farming side because if if we were having this conversation even 12 18 months ago um your typical farm carriers would have said yeah we'll ensure that 4,000 square foot building when you had your trucks and your john deere's in there but as soon as you pull those out and you put drying racks and you hang biomass in it, if that thing burns down, it's, ex it's excluded. Well, that's a problem because a lot of people that we talked to, they had no idea. They did not understand that. And they just figured, oh, we've got it covered. We're good. And so we would, we would really dig in and ask those questions. But now today, um, some of these big farm carriers are coming through and they're issuing or they're, they're creating hemp endorsements and and, and now, to my knowledge, they'll take it. I mean, the one that we work with the most um, will hop on a farm operation, a farming operation, and stay on it until they start extracting. So they call it processing. Processing would be drying, um, shucking, whatever they're doing. But as soon as the extraction starts, they're off. You know, and so we're continuing to work with them saying, well, what's the problem with extraction? You know, let, let's, let's teach them about extraction, and hopefully we can pull them into that process as well. But – um, you know, every, every month it changes. The, the market changes every month, and we have been throwing a hiccup here the last two months with COVID, but hopefully we get through that and um, we get the ball rolling again soon. Yeah, and that's that really says a lot, Dan. That that when you're when you're looking for insurance guy out there, people um, do your due diligence. And you know, I brought these guys on because I know them. I've met with them. I've you know, I've uh, I've dined with them. Uh, these guys are good people. And so, you know, they brought on the, the, uh, the lungs here. Uh, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of information here, a lot of resources, and it's important that you, you know, reach out to people that will actually, you know, 
not just a better word to hold your hand through this insurance. If you're looking for uh, hemp crop insurance, uh, there's no better place to go than uh, IMA or, uh, you know, diversified crop insurance. So, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot here. There's a lot of people on the phone. Is there anybody that wants to chime in and, and talk about, uh, talk about, you know, crop insurance or what we're missing? Is there, did we, have we missed anything? All right, um, hey, Dan. We need to, I, we need to talk. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ted. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, Corey. Um, so um, you know, we're past our federal crop insurance deadlines for federal crop, but also keep in mind there is private plans available out there, and um, there's a, the hail there's hail insurance and there's weather based plans also. And so um, I just didn't want farmers to think, well, I missed the federal guideline. I don't have any chance of crop insurance this year when there there still is plenty of opportunity out there uh, to get crop insurance. And that's where, that's where uh, the National Hemp Insurance Agency and IMA can help out. Okay, so you're saying that the, you can still get you know, still get crop insurance even though we're April. Let's say that, let's say somebody wanted to plant July 1st, you can still help them get crop insurance? Uh, yes. 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 On on uh, not all of our plans, but on several of our plans, um, they they can purchase it uh, up until, you know, the first part of July. Okay. All right. I, I mm-hmm. know people, I know last year we were, you know, we were planting clear into August and, it, you know, it, it ate our lunch. Um, and so I don't mm-hmm. think you're going to see the scramble of getting, you know, that late harvest or that late planting date. I think you know, mm-hmm. the smart, especially with everything going on with the COVID-19 and whatnot, people are, uh, I can see it. The the industry is really just, just contracted immensely. You know, mm-hmm. people we were talking to, they were looking at a thousand or a million seedlings. They're, you know, it's, it's really hard because the hemp industry technically still is a, a, for a better word, uh, it's a cash. It's a cash crop. It, you pull out a million dollars in cash, and you pay. You know, it's not actually cash, but um, it could be. It very well could be. I've seen it. Um, and they go and buy these seedlings, and then they put them in the ground, and it's a risk. But with everything going on in the world, I just don't see people doing that very much. I don't. Uh, unless you've got an actual e- extraction facility that you're going to be, you know personally providing for I, I just it's it's hard for me to see this and of course i'm the i'm the half empty guy so um this definitely the the covid19 has definitely thrown some cold water on on this thing so um mm-hmm. what uh what are yep. you guys you know as far as you know that's hemp insurance where we've talked about what other you know crop insurance you guys are involved in i'm sure in just about everything i mean Ted explained that you guys started out, you know, a long time ago when the earth was green, uh, providing crop insurance. What other, what other crops can you guys insure? Well, under the federal program, there's over 135 crops. So, um, you know, even though, even though the National Hemp Insurance Agency specializes in hemp, they, they can write, um, you know, uh, every crop out there, um, and on the crop insurance company side, uh, which I'm coming from diversified side, um, well, if it's a federal, if it's a, a, a crop that's listed as a federal crop uh, to insure, we're going to insure it. Okay. All right. Um, I, I'm sitting here looking at the podcast here, and I, I just I just copied and pasted what uh, Jared had sent, um, or actually Ted, you had sent the the. Uh, bio type stuff i think we need definitely need to put some uh numbers and contact information and i'll make sure we get that in there um well any anything else i know dan wants to go he wants to talk about uh vegan um vegan (laughs) you know plant-based plant-based burgers i know he wants to talk about that and uh actually kenny why don't you go or actually dan because you so you told it so well Tell the story about how Kenny bought you a breakfast sandwich. All right. Well, I guess um, 
Now that we've you know, lost all the listeners from from <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey, it's just, I, I got to say the uh, uh, the insurance is definitely. Um, well, I'm glad I got you guys uh, guys here because the insurance thing is it's for me. It's just over my head. I have a hard time digesting it. So. Uh, having a little bit of uh, humor and comedy into this thing, uh, it helps. So, <laughs> any bought you a sandwich? Tell us about your sandwich. Yeah, so we were on our way to see a client um, early one morning. And I'll just start off to say that I, I'm not against any um, vegan, anything like that. I have no problem with it all, but that's just <laughs> not me. Um, I'm, I'm an avid hunter and fisher, and I, I mean, I live on – um, venison and, and wild game. So Kenny knew that I would be a good target to test to see if these commercials that we see are true or not. And so it's early in the morning. We're headed up. Um, we were headed actually north to Kansas City. And we pull into a restaurant, and Kenny asked if I need anything. I said, yeah, I'll just take a sausage, egg, and cheese. So he brings it out. I unwrap it. I take my first bite, and oh, I, I, I immediately recognized that this was not what I was looking for, um, that something was up with the sandwich. And Kenny kept a straight face. He did a great job um, pulling the joke off. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I thought, well, maybe this is just a different restaurant I'm not used to, right? <laughs> and I took another bite, and um, Kenny couldn't hold it back anymore, and he started busting out laughing. And he said, I had to use you as my test subject because I knew if anybody's going to notice that it, it was you. And – yeah, damn sure right. I, I knew it, noticed it as soon as it hit the palate. Uh, that was not real <laughs> sausage. Well, uh, you know this. I was, while you were talking, Dan, <laughs> while you were talking, this I, the reason why we're actually talking about this is that you know I posted something. I posted a video. Uh, what was early this week? No, it was early last week. Um, I posted a video about the. Um, you know, the farmer, the food chain supply and what's going on uh, with the, the broken food chain. Um, and it caused, you know, it's, I looked at it this morning. It's almost been seen 12,000 times. Um, absolutely insane. And actually the one uh, with Shea Myers on it, he, his has been seen. And I got to say it was back a week ago. It was seen 60,000 times. Uh, the times flew out. And, and interviewed him. That's how big a story it was. And so we're we're having this conversation about the food chain. And of course, I get I get the people that think that big ag should die a slow, painful death, and we should all eat carrots and you know these plant based burgers and whatnot. And you know they're pretty adamant about it, but they have no idea what the food chain even means. And so that's why uh, you know, Dan emailed me this morning and said that he was going to uh, be a plant-based advocate this for this episode. So that's how the, the, the vegan burger so, story came so about. So if, if, if you've ever seen Dumb and Dumber, uh, Corey and Beth, there's there's a scene on there where uh, where those guys put rat poison on on the bad guy's burger, <laughs> <laughs> and they're they're holding back laughing so hard, saying, "Why don't you eat up and find out?" That's that's about how I visualize this a little bit. Um, it, it, with similar <laughs> results, Dan was not happy that he just got forced to eat a, a vegan burger. <laughs> you might have gotten. You might have gotten. Yeah, I don't think I'd have been as did did he did he strike you? Because I might have struck you. I might have I might have slapped he you. Was, what? Yes. Kenny was driving at that time, but you know what? He was a good sport, and he actually took a bite himself just to experience it as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, so let's yeah, touch you gotta on this. You got to keep things fun when you spend as much time on the road as we did. You got stories like that in galore. I mean, there was a there was a pterodactyl that was climbing into my, my shirt one day on the, on the highway. And Dan's just laughing his butt off, slapping me on the back as we're passing these semis. And I, all of a sudden <laughs> I, I get out like, uh, like there's bees all over and I'm just trying to get this huge bug out from under my shirt. We're on the side <laughs> we, of the highway and it looked fun. like Tommy boy took his shirt off. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> You guys, you guys are, you guys are, you guys are funny. You guys are good. You guys are good. Hey, so let's real quick, let's let's circle back and let me think. Let me ask a question on the insurance side 
what is this when when people have to till under their lettuce or they have to you know destroy their crops um i don't think that there's an insurance for that right well it um i guess it depends on what crop and what program that it's in i mean if it's a if it's a federal product and they need to destroy it of course you need to turn in a loss and have an adjuster go out there and authorize anything like that before. Ted, have you seen that video that 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 uh, Shay put out, where he dumped that million pounds of onions in a ditch? You know, I've been seeing that a lot lately. You, you know, dairy farmers are dumping out milk, and uh, and and fruit and vegetable farmers don't have any marketplace to take their pro- their produce to uh, product to since the restaurants are closed and things like that. And one thing that I can tell you is that USDA and the RMA, the Risk Management Agency, they're taking a close look at um, trying to figure out what to do to help help uh, help out in this type of uh, you know situation that they're in today. It's it's unfortunate, but um, you know that CARES Act that passed, um, you know it's a 2.2 trillion dollar package, and there is some help. Uh, coming to the ag sector uh, through the Commodity Credit Corp Corporation. Uh, that's what will feed into the USDA programs. And I do know that there is help coming. I don't know how fast it is or what it's going to look like. But uh, uh, I just feel really bad for our nation's farmers today and what they're going through. Yeah, it's it's a tough. You know, I grew up. I was born and raised on a dairy farm. And Beth, she she was uh, she was on a dairy farm there for a while. Actually, how many years were you on a dairy farm, Beth? Uh, about 23. 20, 23 years. So, born and raised. Her she was she was married to a dairy farmer. Actually, her ex husband and I were friends in high school because our our parents were dairy farmers. So, we kind of grew up yeah. in the in the dairy farm business. And so, watching these videos of dairy farmers dumping milk, just it, it has a different effect on you. You wouldn't think that it does. But watching yeah. that, just it's like, uh, and and I guess that's why I get so passionate about when people come on, you know, a video that I'm talking about something, and they're like, "Well, you suck because you kill, you hurt animals, or you know, you deserve everything you're getting." Yeah, it really gets me wound up because it's personal. I don't. I know when, I, when yeah, when I'm in Washington D.C., uh, you just would not believe. Of course, I I educate. Um, legislative assistance and, uh, you know, uh, on the federal crop program and why why do we need food and food sustainability and reliability and quality and why we it's, – it's imperative that we keep our farmers financially healthy and we support our farmers. We need that. And this, this, one, uh, this one lady I talked to one day, of course, she was from the city, and uh, she didn't realize that milk came from a cow. She thought it came from almonds. Because oh, no. Oh, almond milk. So that's oh, some gosh. of the education that I had to do in D.C. And and sometimes I go to uh, food sustainability conferences in D.C. And I know the dairy industry, they are really upset at mislabeling. You know, you go to the, you go to the food store and you see almond milk. And it's like, really? You know? Uh, almonds don't have teats. Cows do, and, and it's not almond milk. So uh, there's just a lot of education that needs to take place, and uh, they need to. People really need to uh, find out uh, how their food choices and things like that really impacts farmers. I, as a as a as a kid, my dad did uh, uh, field trips out to the dairy for like fifth and sixth graders and every year one kid would ask where are the brown cows at what do you mean where, where, where are you asking about the brown cows well they make the chocolate milk uh, that's what my parents told me as a child that chocolate milk comes from brown cows <laughs> awesome yeah see i uh i married a dairy farmer's daughter and i live behind the dairy farm I've been married 36 oh. years yeah, you know, and, you know uh, exactly the smell of money, right? Oh, the smell of money. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we, yeah, my uh, my brother-in-law, he had a city slicker friend come out one time, and he thought you had to pump the cow's tail to get the milk to come out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's a new one. Haven't heard that one before. <laughs> I had a buddy come out from school and he was out helping me. We were moving hay and feeding the cows and stuff. And he, he was terrified of the bulls. No, we don't have bulls, but I never let him know that there was no bulls. And so every once I'm like, oh, watch out for now. He's coming. He would, on, he would jump on the fence and he would. Oh, that's, it's not very nice. But when you, Hey, man. <laughs> Sorry, I just pictured Verdell jumping over a fence at Mach six to keep away from yeah. from a from a dairy cow. So yeah. Anyway, you know, guys, I really appreciate your time. I know that this went a lot longer than than you uh, were expecting, and we had a delayed start time. But you guys have been great. Um, I can't thank you enough for being here. Kenny, thank you for setting this all up. Uh, Ted, Jared. Uh, Dan, you guys, you know, welcome on the show anytime. If you want to, if you've got a, a hot topic you want to jump on, uh, just let me know and we'll get you on, okay? Thank you. Sounds good, Corey. Thank you. All right. All right. And I'll make sure Thanks, I'll Corey. make sure right, I put all your. talking to you, Ben. Absolutely. It was good I'll make sure to I put you all yeah, we need to, we need to have you next time you're in, you're next year up in the Pacific Northwest. We need to hook up and, uh, Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll buy the beer next time. <laughs> yeah, call, call us up. We'll come out and we'll help pull some male plants. There you go. You, we, we can have a little oh, male pulling plant contest. There you go. No. <laughs> so I'll make sure I got all you guys' contact information in the in the in the uh, bio here, and so if somebody reads this, they can get a hold of you. But uh, once again, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks, all right, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great rest Thanks, of your day, guys. Good luck, everyone. All right. Thank, thank you. you guys. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. All right. Well, Beth, your first yeah, co-host that was gig. pretty good. I think it went. I think it went well. Yes, I agree. I, went, I agree. We should do it again sometime. Uh, I think we're going to be doing one. We have one Friday actually. We're going to be talking about right. decortication. So, um, yeah, I think I'll do this my is research good one. so I can ask questions. Well, that's uh, the co-producers or the producers, executive producers' job. So, uh, uh, <laughs> I think that's your job, not mine. So. All right, guys, this is uh, Hemp Logic Radio. Uh, this is Corey and uh, my co host, Beth, and we are out. Have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Bye.